So it is my hope that uh, you found time to listen to the extensive lecture on topographic anatomy of the neck triangles, and in particular, the posterior neck triangle, uh, because this particular session will just give a summary of that lecture on the posterior neck triangles. It's just giving you the take home message from that particular lecture. Um, we'll start with just a review of the cervical spine. Remember that uh, the cervical spine consists of seven vertebrae. In a lateral view, we note that uh, the cervical spine displays the lodotic curve, which means that it's convex anteriorly and concave posteriorly. We have a total of seven cervical vertebrae. The C3 to C6 vertebra are termed the typical cervical vertebra because of some things which are unique about them. One is that uh, they have bifid spinous processes. So this is typical for cervical vertebra with the exception of the C7 vertebra, which doesn't have a bifid spinous process, and the C1 vertebra, which has a posterior tubercle instead of the spinous process. The second unique thing about typical cervical vertebra is the presence of the transverse foramen for the passage of the vertebral arteries. So this is usually present in typical cervical vertebra. We do not usually have the foramen transversarium in a C7 vertebra in many occasions because most of the time the vertebral artery does not pass through the C7 vertebra. It will enter through C6 vertebra going upwards. In this particular situation, the C7 vertebra head one, and that's why you see it there. Also take note that a typical cervical vertebra has a triangular um, vertebral canal, as you can see there. And that usually it has the ancinate processes on either side, which are not visualized here because of the view we're having. The second vertebra there is the atlas, unique because of the press of the anterior and posterior arches, absence of the body, wide neural canal, press of anterior and posterior tubercles. These are the, called the lateral masses, which articulate with the occipital bone. The axis there is unique. This is the C2 vertebra because the presence of the odontoid process, which is an upward projection from the body of the axis. So don't process also called the dense or the don't peg act as the body of the atlas, but part of the axis. Take note that the axis still has a bifid spinous process, although it's a bit unique, appears a bit broad, but still bifid as we can see. Axis also has lateral masses. The C7 vertebra called vertebra prominence is not typical because of what we've already mentioned. The spinous process of C7 vertebra is prolonged compared to the others, it's, it's longer. However, it is not bifid. And usually it projects more posteriorly. And then C7 vertebra usually lacks the foramen transversarium. So C1, C2, and C7 are atypical, while C6 to C3 to C6 are typical cervical vertebra. You also discussed in the lecture the craniovertebral junction consisting of uh, the atlanto occipital joints and the atlanto axial joints. Remember, atlanto occipital joints are on two parts, this part and that part. These are the facets of the atlas that receive the conducts of the occipital. The assignable joints, they allow flexion and extension movements. 
atlanto axial joints more complex, consisting of three joints, that particular point there between the lateral masses of uh, axis and also the joint between the odontoid peg and the anterior arc of atlas in front or the transverse atlanto ligament behind. Remember that transverse atlanto ligament is part of the cruciate ligam ligaments and it articulates the posterior surface of the odontoid peg so that odontoid peg has articular facets both in front and behind. And it kind of restricts, the ligament restricts the odontoid peg. Remember the odontoid peg is on the anterior aspect of the neural canal of the, of the atlas itself. Several ligaments are present at this point, the ala ligament and the apical ligament of the dense attach the dense to the margins of the foramen magnum. Then we have the cruciate ligament, which restricts the dense into its position. The cruciate ligaments attach to the atlas on the transverse portions and then vertical portions attach, as you can see in that particular image. Other than that, there are many other ligaments around. I hope you remember the Atlanto occipital membrane, anterior and posterior one, the ligamentum flavum, the tectorial ligament or membrana tectoria that is an extension of the posterior lateral ligament over this region. In terms of superficial structures in the neck, we have the platysma, which is inevitable the facial nerve. It's a second, it's a mass of the second pharyngeal arc origin. We also have superficial veins, uh, the anterior jugular vein running in front and the external jugular vein crossing the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Remember, external jugular vein terminates into the subclavian. The anterior jugular veins right and left meet at the jugular arc, but they still also terminate either at the external jugular vein or subclavian directly. We also have the cutaneous nerves, which come from the cervical plexus and they supply the skin of the neck. So we have the ones from the ventoremi, the ones which form the cervical plexus, but you also have nerves from the dorsoremi, which do not form plexus, but they also supply the skin of the neck. So they are still uh, superficially remember that uh, these nerves have specific names. So you have supraclavicular, transverse cervical, greater auricular, and uh, less occipital nerve there. Going deep, uh, this neck has several deep fascia system. The investing fascia covers the whole of the neck, but encloses some muscles, sternocleidomastoid and trapezius, the blue one. The pretracheal fascia encloses the thyroid gland together with the trachea, the esophagus. We have the prevertebral fascia, which encloses the muscles of the, around the vertebral column, including also the brachial plexus. And then we have the carotid sheath, which encloses the common carotid artery, internal jugular vein, vagus nerve. Carotid sheath is a union of the other three deep cervical fascia system. Here you talk about the triangles. So we divide the neck triangles into two based on the location of the sternocleidomastoid. Behind sternocleidomastoid, the posterior triangle, and anterior to sternocleidomastoid is the anterior triangle. The posterior triangles are divided as this way. So we have the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid, the anterior border of trapezius, and the middle one third of the clavicle. Defining the boundaries of the posterior triangle. If we introduce the inferior biliform height there, we divide the posterior triangle into occipital triangle above and supraclavicular triangle below. Supraclavicular triangle is also called the subclavian triangle. 
For the anterior triangle, we use the anterior border of sternocleidal mastoid, the inferior border of the mandible, and uh, the midline of the neck to define the anterior triangle. The anterior triangle is further divided into four smaller triangles based on the location of the following, the homohyoid muscle, superior belly, digastric muscle, both anterior and posterior belly, as well as the stylohyoid muscle there. So between the superior belly of homohyoid, the sternocleidal muscle, the anterior border, and the midline, we have the muscular triangle there. Between superior belly of homohyoid, the anterior border of sternocleidal mastoid, and the posterior belly of digastric, together with the stylohyoid muscle, we have the carotid triangle there. So the one called superior carotid is the one we are calling carotid triangle. That's the convectional name, and that's the one I wanted to pick rather than calling superior carotid. Then the one that is being called here inferior carotid, don't call it inferior carotid, that's a very old term. Call it the muscular triangle of the neck. This region bounded by both bellies of digastric or even the stylohyoid and the inferior board of the mandible, that's the submandibular triangle. Let's call it submandibular triangle or the digastric triangle. So don't call it submaxillary triangle, call it submandibular triangle. And then this region here of the anterior belly of digastric, right and left, together with the midline and the hide bone there, that is the submental triangle the one being called there, the suprahyoid triangle, the submental triangle. So I'm using new terminologies here to help you, but I've also put those older terminologies for you uh, because you may get them in some books and uh, so you need some clarification about them. In particular, we also talked in that lecture about some muscles that constitute the borders of the posterior neck triangle. Trapezius is one of them. It's a muscle of the back, primarily a muscle of the upper limb that migrated to the back. It's called trapezius because when you have the right and the left, it looks like a trapezium. Remember, it has superior, intermediate, and lower fibers. It's innervated by the spinal accessory nerve, superior fibers elevate the scapula, inferior fibers depress, and uh, the intermediate fibers retract. If the superior and the inferior fibers act together with the serratus anterior muscle, then they cause scapular lateral rotation. Trapezius also receives proprioceptive innervation from the cervical plexus. We are using the anterior border of the superior fibers of uh, trapezius to define the posterior border of the posterior triangle. These superior fibers of trapezius insert onto the lateral aspect of the clavicle, lateral third of the clavicle. Then we have sternocleidomastoid, which arises from the sternum and the medial one third of the clavicle and insert onto the muscle process as well as the superior nuchal line. This muscle is also innervated by the spinal accessory nerve. When both contract, they flex the neck. When only one contract, it turns the neck to the contralateral side in rotation. Remember, we use the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid anterior border of trapezius superior fibers and middle third of the clavicle to define the posterior triangle. Also note that the cutaneous nerves that arise usually rise in relation to the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle. This muscle itself is above a number of structures deep to it, but those are mainly covered under anterior triangle, so we'll not talk about them things like internal jugular vein, common carotid, are covered under the anterior triangles. The third muscle is the homohyoid muscle, which has inferior belly and superior belly. 
and an intermediate tendon there that is held lower down by the investing fascia. We call that extension the homohyde sling. The posterior belly of, sorry, the inferior belly of homohyde is the one that is in the posterior triangle. The superior belly of homohyde is in the anterior triangle. It is one of the infrahyoid muscles, therefore innervated by the anser cervicalis. So those are the musculature that form the boundaries of the posterior triangles. In the posterior triangle, we have the occipital triangle and the supraclavicular triangle. In the occipital triangle, the things you're supposed to take note of as contents are the cutaneous branches of the cervical plexus as they come out from the nerve point, anterior cutaneous nerve of the neck, greater auricular nerve, less occipital nerve, supraclavicular nerves, their sensory nerves. You're supposed to take note of the termination of the external jugular vein. Remember that uh, the external jugular vein is superficial predominantly, but it pierces the deep fascia lower down to terminate into the subclavian vein. Uh, we have the spinal accessory nerve that crosses uh, from the posterior border of sternocleidomastoid to the anterior border of trapezius there, crossing over the muscle uh, laveta scapulae. So these nerves are the major content of the occipital triangle. Apart from the nerves, we also have lymph nodes, which are also major content of the posterior triangle. Remember the lymph nodes here are termed level five lymph nodes. The level anatomy of the cervical lymph nodes will be best covered when we look at the anterior neck triangles. In the supraclavicular triangle bounded by the inferior belly of homohyde, the middle third of the clavicle and posterior border of sternocleidomastoid muscle contain the subclavian artery, at least the third part of it. It also contains the trunks of the brachial plexus. So those are the major content of the supraclavicular triangle, also called subclavian triangle but we may also have branches of the thyrocervical trunk as they traverse the triangle, both into the supraclavicular as well as into the occipital triangle. This is the suprascapular artery, that the transverse cervical artery. The termination of external jugular vein is also now present within the subclavian triangle. Finally, in the occipital triangle, remember it's a deep triangle, between the posterior aspect of the occipital bone and the upper two cervical vertebrae, bounded by three muscles. These are the three muscles. The major content of the suboxial triangle is the vertebral artery. Remember, this will constitute the third part of the vertebral artery. We also have the suboccipital nerve, which is the C1 nerve. We have the suboxal venous plexus that masquerade around here. On the roof of this triangle, we have the semispinalis capitis. And uh, on top of that, we have the superior fibers of trapezius. Great. So I believe that's a good summary of the anatomy of the posterior neck triangles.